Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Dan Kazita. Dan is an expert on chemical and biological weapons. He's also the author of the fantastic book Toxic, which is a history of nerve agents from Nazi Germany to Putin's Russia. On today's show, we discuss the conspiracy theories around so-called biolabs, and we talk about the potential use of chemical and nuclear weapons in the war in Ukraine. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Dan, welcome back to the podcast. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Great to have you back on. Um, we're here to talk about Ukraine and, and sort of chemical weapons and all sorts of things. So um, first of all, I suppose, what was your reaction when you heard that Russia had invaded Ukraine? A mixture of disappointment and annoyance, really, because I had really kind of gambled that this was all some sort of high stakes poker and that, uh, you know, Putin was going to try to extort some sort of concessions or maybe even a little bit of salami slicing. And even the first day or so of the invasion, I thought, well, he's just making doing another 2014 trying to you know slice off another bit of eastern Ukraine or something like that. And then 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 the reality sets in that, that holy, holy crap, this is the big one. This is the you know, this is the biggest land war in, uh, in Europe since 1945. Mm. Despite what people say, it's not the only one. We seem to forget Yugoslavia. But <laughs> we do. Yeah. But this is this is this is a higher intensity conflict than uh, we're used to seeing. Actually, what's Putin sort of trying to get out of this? Do you think? What are his motivations? That's a huge question. One we've been kicking around. A lot of people have been kicking around. I mean, this is a guy who has surrounded himself with sycophants and yes men for for well well over a decade now. So he doesn't have anybody in his inner circle to say, "Hey, look, mate, you're 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 high on your own supply here." I mean, what the hell is going on? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, I think he might actually believe his old, his expressed worldview that the Soviet Union was a good thing and he needs to try to stick it back together as best as possible. And playing into this Russian nationalist idea that you know, Ukrainians are just Russians who've gone a bit bit funny and they're really the same people sort of thing. Uh, you know, and Ukrainians aren't that way, you know, um, as he's discovering. Ukraine has a relatively limited history of nationhood and you know, national identity, but it's a valid one just because it's only, you know, 130, 140 years old, really. If you go back, you, you got to really just go back to the late 1800s where you find the idea of Ukraine being something separate. I mean, if you look at these books from the 1600s, 1700s, they refer to that area as Little Russia, the Little Russians, and Belarus is the White Russians, you know. Mm. Um, but what you really do see here is, in effect, this is a civil war you know, between Eastern Slavs in, in a certain sense, in the same way that the conflict in Yugoslavia was a civil war between Southern Slavs. And it's it's playing itself out. I mean, one way you could, it's probably controversial for me to do this, but one way, uh, you know, a historian or geographer could characterize Ukraine is they are Eastern Slavs with a Western outlook. Okay. Mm. Uh, in a lot of senses, you know, they draw, you know, Ukrainians draw much of their history from the Habsburg Empire, from particularly in Western Ukraine. They draw history from Poland, from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, and so, that, you know, they are a people who have forked off historically from Russia itself a long time ago. So, I mean, I, uh, this is a level of geopolitics I'm not sure you wanted to get into, but uh, there you go. <laughs> well, no, well, thank you for that. One thing I wanted to get into there was some of the misinformation that's sort of going around. So like with the with Syria, the Russian government has been spreading misinformation to sort of justify their actions there. So two key claims that seem to have come up with regards to Ukraine. The first one is something to do with this biolab that's somehow oh, yeah, connected yeah. to Dr. Fauci and the coronavirus. Oh, yeah. um, and then the other claim is that Ukraine is developing sort of chemical weapons to use against Russia. 
Can you talk just about some of this? Okay, okay. I, I say I put these things in the context of uh, these are you, you've hit upon the two bits of uh, conspiracy theory that come into sort of my area, especially. Yeah. But this is there's a rainbow of stuff. Okay, <laughs> there's a rainbow of stuff. You know, conspiracy theories. Yeah, the Ukrainian government is run by Nazis. You know, blah blah blah. This is all made up. You know, this is just a NATO, you know the siege of Mariupol is just happening on the NATO soundstage. You know? I mean, there's there's a ridiculous spectrum of claims of which you've just sort of you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into two of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The 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 the, the bio lab thing is disingenuous. First of all, on several levels. First of all, it's sort of relies on a sort of intellectual laziness to say so a biological laboratory is obviously of course nefarious and obviously biological warfare there's thousands of laboratories all over the world doing biology i mean every university campus practically is i mean so trying to sort of taint the term biolab mm. you know and, and the thing is nobody really uses biolab as a thing it's a made-up term you go to a university there'll be a life sciences laboratory there might be a biology laboratory or a botany laboratory or you know you know some variety and specifically we're talking about veterinary health laboratories yeah okay <laughs> all right and go figure veterinary laboratories study diseases and diseases that are prevalent in livestock <laughs> okay because that's kind of what you do in a veterinary laboratory so and yes you can find a grain of truth in the past veterinary diseases like anthrax were used as biological weapons at least in theory and if not in practice so you can stitch together you know a little web of of half truths and you know grains of truth and then try to spin something out of it and it seems to be what's going on here if you look at the broader context if you go back to sort of the late 80s, early 1990s, when the Soviet Union was falling apart, there were a bunch of people, not a bunch of people, actually a small nucleus of people in the, uh, in the Pentagon mm. yeah, and the State Department saying, gosh, you know, the Soviet Union is coming unhinged. And we know they've got all these scientists in the nuclear and biological and chemical fields and some other you know, relevant fields. Uh, what we really need is a big public works project to keep these guys all employed, even if it's just sitting in a room reading scientific journals and abstracting them for us. Because we don't need, you know, anthrax specialists running off to North Korea or to, you know, work for Gaddafi in Libya and stuff like that. So this whole thing of cooperative threat reduction came up. And this, you know, it seems funny now, but there were much better relations between the U.S. and Russia in those days. You know, this we're talking now the Yeltsin years. Uh, so the, the U.S. funded, continues to fund a bunch of projects where they would take people who really were – either peripherally or centrally in the bad old stuff, the dark arts, uh, and put them to work doing things that are meant to be of you know, great use. Uh, and, that, and Russia itself is a great beneficiary of all this stuff. You know, Over the years, I've met various Russian scientists who work in various institutes on this stuff. And so this is, you know, I mean, yet another example of Putin sort of biting the hand that feeds him. Yeah, the Russian government, the Russian government, the Russian state, the Russian economy benefited greatly off of, off of this cooperative threat reduction. It was doing things like there's a chemical factory in you know Volgograd, formerly Stalingrad. It was it's the Bekatovka plant. It was the sarin factory, mm -hmm. uh, and so the cooperative threat reduction program helped demilitarize the sarin bit of it and helped actually convert it into you know peaceful production of you know. Things like flame re fire retardants and you know feedstock chemicals for pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. I I wrote a vast deep dive paper on it for for Rusi uh, you know, last year. Uh, you know and I don't think anybody's actually read my paper on it, but you know. <laughs> but so these things happen. So this this network of labs in Ukraine is based out of this this role this uh, this this program. It's similar to dozens, if not hundreds, of projects on this. You can just Google cooperative threat reduction. And it's not secretive. I mean, these this, these aren't secret programs. These are you know open programs. They, they've got PowerPoint slides and the <laughs> annual reports <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, it's just, it's it's just that the average person doesn't know that they exist because they don't pay attention to this stuff. It's kind of boring. It's all boring until it isn't. Yeah, indeed, indeed, and it leads to that sort of conspiratorial thinking because people are just shocked that people study diseases. It's like, well, of course you study diseases because how do you stop them? Well, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, in the former Soviet Union. Like a lot of other places, diseases of livestock are of economic importance. You don't want to have an out anthrax outbreak in cattle. You don't want a, a, a Q fever. Uh, that's the other one. 
we have a Q fever. Oh my God, what is it? You know, it's a real thing. <laughs> it's just that people don't normally get it unless you work in an Australian slaughterhouse. Then you might get yeah. it. Uh, but I assume it's not linked to QAnon. Then. No, 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 no. <laughs> but you know, you wouldn't believe the weirdos. On it, or oh my God, plague. Well, pl- <laughs> bubonic plague is endemic in Central Asia. It's where it came from. Okay, you know, looking at these diseases, surveilling these sorts of things. You know. You know, this is this is routine sort of baseline public health, veterinary health stuff runs off in the background. It's yeah, you know, there was a little bit of oh my god, there's these captured documents showing that they destroyed these samples. Um, okay, so put yourself in that in the seat of uh, a lab director, a Ukrainian lab director, and the Russians are coming, and you've got dangerous pathogens in vials in a fridge. What are you going to do? You could leave them for the Russians, I suppose. Probably not a good idea, though. <laughs> you could shove them in your pocket and run away with them. Yeah, I suppose mishaps could happen. So they did exactly the right thing, and they got rid of them. And not only that, they wrote up some documents saying this is what we did. And then if you look, if you actually look at these silly documents, you know, which yeah, I mean, the strain of the strain of anthrax they're working with is not a strain of anthrax that causes diseases in humans. It's not the one I would. Yeah, it's, it's something called the Stern strain. It's often used to. Often used in lab stuff because of that. Yeah. Anyway, we can get really technical on that. So that's the bio lab. The bio lab thing has been spun out of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as the oh, the Ukrainians are going to engage in chemical warfare. That's you know, I mean, first of all, Ukraine has a chemical industry. Having a chemical industry is a is a precursor to having chemical warfare. Chemical weapons don't come out of nothing, you know. And to actually do chemical warfare on a battlefield level between states. You need actually serious infrastructure. It's not like you need just a jar of stuff. You need tons of stuff. And it has to be made somewhere. Mm. Okay. Now, U- Ukraine has a chemical industry. Most modern countries do. But there's no evidence of chemical warfare development. None. Uh, not only that, you know, there's been decades, the last couple, the last, sort of last 15, 20 years, you know, Ukraine, like Russia, like everybody in the West, has been party to this chemical weapons convention, subject to inspections. There's a, there's a mechanism by which the Russians say, oh, Ukraine has a chemical warfare program. Go inspect it. You know, it's called a challenge inspection in the OPCW. And none of that's happened. It's like all of a sudden these claims come out of nowhere after bullets are flying yeah. as opposed to anything before. And a chemical warfare program in a relatively open society like Ukraine. And Ukraine is not North Korea, okay? A, a chemical warfare program of a, of a state level size would involve hundreds, if not thousands of people. Uh, and that's the sort of conspiracy that never stays secret for very long. Somebody will, somebody will either figuratively or literally leak something. Uh, chemical weapons programs off, uh, can often be rumbled by, you know, uh, environmental disasters or accidents or somebody turning up dead, you know. Uh, <laughs> and so there's, 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 there's none of this. So it's, uh, it's another one of these totally made up things. It's like the Nazi claim. Yeah, there are there are Nazis. You know what? Here's the thing. America's got Nazis. Mm. Britain has them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it, oh, God, I'm not going to name any names. But you know who we're talking about. There are unsavory characters on the far right in basically every country between here and, you know, Japan. Okay. And so you could take that and say, all right, oh, they got Nazis. Well, Russia's got Nazis. Russia's been financing them for crying out loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> now a lot of that is that particular claim is 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 Putin doing that for domestic consumption because the great I, I, it's, I would I would call it national myth, but it's not a myth. It's a real thing. They fought a real war against real Nazis, mm. and it's this heroic. It's the it's this keystone of history in the last century, uh, and that glorious victory over the Nazis is used to paper over an awful lot of other things that aren't so glorious. Okay. Uh, but that also means that, oh my God, that's it. Pick up your arms, boys. We're going at it again. You know, it's a call to this nostalgia from that era. Yeah. And the fact that there are a few real Nazis floating around doesn't set that theory back. It gives an example. Oh, look, Nazi, you know, it gets a little funny when you start like, uh, not funny, not funny, funny, but you know, odd funny. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, the president of Ukraine's Jewish. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jewish guys in charge of Nazis. It involves a sort of weird contortion. Yeah, it gets very interesting. I tell you who does have chemical weapons and could use them is the Russian government. What are your thoughts on what they have? Well, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one because 
you know, the Russians are in an interesting legal position in that they have a shit from the uh, from the world government saying or from the world's governments from the OPCW. Everybody else, they have they have paperwork and receipts saying that they got rid of their their chemical warfare program. Legally, they don't have one. Okay, mm. and not just hundreds, but thousands of Westerners were involved in the and, and people observers from neutral countries were involved in the whole process to get rid of that. And it was an extensive Cold War program uh, and an extensive effort, you know, heavily underwritten by 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 other countries to get rid of it. And there's receipts and documentation on that. Okay, and so. Russia can stand up and say, you have certified that we don't have chemical weapons, all right? And that's a legal document because nobody has actually gone through the process of saying, you bastards, you were secretly having a, 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 a chemical warfare program. We want a challenge inspection of this site or that site or that site. Uh, nobody has done that because it's been sort of like the third rail after that. It's what we should have done after the, after the Skripal thing. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, with Sergei Skripal and Don Sturgis and Nick Bailey and Yulia Skripal and that other guy, Charlie Rowley, you have five people in the, in the, in the UK, one of whom dies. Uh, we got another incident, you know, Navalny's underpants. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there, and and yeah. if you start pulling the threads on this, uh, a possible third incident uh, before those other two in, in Bulgaria with a guy named Gibrev. I think it was a guy's name, Gibrev. I'd have to look it up. Another possible poisoning. Uh, we never quite identified the exact substance, but it was most almost certainly a nerve agent along in these ca- sort of in this category. It could have been a commercial pesticide, but it's hard to say. This points out, okay, at least in theory, you know, they've got sort of eyedropper type quantities of chemicals. Now there, now there's a fundamental world of difference between. All right, somebody's got a jar of a sample jar of bad stuff left over from the old days stuck in a drawer somewhere. Okay, possible, because the chemical demilitarization program was designed to take, you know, destroy chemical artillery rounds and you know, level the factories and stuff like that. Uh, in a country the size of Russia, you can shove a few things in a desk drawer somewhere and you not say anything. Or retain the ability to, in some lab somewhere, produce small quantities. Now, what nobody knows is whether or not any capability above that exists. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that, again, to, to actually have some capability that was useful on a battlefield in more than, say, one incident. I mean, uh, you know, an actual military ca- capability uh, in a country the size of Russia would be big enough that we would have noticed for the same reasons why we would have noticed in Ukraine. Somebody would have buggered off to the West and blown a whistle on it. Some accident would have happened. And this is, I mean, you know, whether or not the Russians are engaged in chemical and biological weapons research has always been one of these things that the intelligence communities of the world look at. That's fairly high on the list. That's something people look for. You know, I'm, I'm not in the intelligence services, never have, despite, you know, the, the accusations of certain people in Scotland who we won't mention. Um, but I have, I've spent a lot of time back in the day reading the intelligence products, okay? It's been 14 years, you know, since I last saw one of those things. But, you know, even 14 years ago, the, uh, the idea was, well, the Russians have it. It's got to be small and well hidden. Okay, that doesn't mean that they can't provoke some sort of incident. Yeah, and I'd say, okay, at this point, what would that do? I, I think right now there's this. You know, I spent much of yesterday, you know, emailing print journalists uh, uh, who they all wanted to talk to me. I was stuck in the library trying to finish a book, so I ended up emailing these guys and try and several of them sort of ended up copying and pasting several things. So uh, apologies guys, you're probably going to listen to this, but you know, some of you got the same damn email yesterday. <laughs> um, we're in this weird feedback loop in the West about chemical weapons, chemical, we- uh, chemical weapons are awful. Uh, Russia might use chemical weapons. That would be awful. Okay. So, okay. That's, that's a feedback loop. Then you sort of unpack that. Okay. Why are chemical weapons awful? Oh, because they're banned. Okay. Well, why are they banned? Well, obviously, because they're awful. Um, well, let's unpack this a bit. Why are they awful? And, you know, unless you talk to a specialty defense journalist, you know, uh, nobody has an easy answer to that. Uh, because, actually, over the last century, since the, since the First World War, we have built chemical weapons into something that the historical record does not actually support. Okay. So I'm not saying chemical weapons are a good thing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, mainstream military thought since for the last hundred years, since the end of the First World War, has largely said they're not worth the effort. Okay. So 
Let me put it to you this way. If I was if I was a general in charge of an army in country X, and I call I call in my specialists in chemical warfare and explain to them when it, when the stuff is going to work, when it's not going to work, all that. And I would say, okay, I'd pull in one of my clever staff officers, a colonel from the plans office, and I'd say, here's a calendar of the year. Yeah, you know, 365 days in the year. We have uh, all these days in the year. There's you know 24 hours a day. Let's put a little red X on all the times. A little. Let's little, use the highlighter pen. When, when when are all the times when the chemical weapons uses are ideal? Okay, in a particular area of the world that we we see ourselves fighting in, and that's you know right off the whole days when it's not going to work because there are weather conditions and times of day where using chemical weapons are better than others. Okay, so the, and let's let's compare that to the conventional weapons. Okay. Mm. And so you get this chart with a lot of red on it, you know, and a lot, not so much green. If green means ideal, red, you know, red is, you know, useless. So you get maybe 5% of the hours in a year in a typical environment, less in some other environments, you know, uh, jungles, for example, you know, sort of in sort of a European type environment. So sort of, you, you might get 5% of the year where clearly the, the, the variables have lined up uh, where there will be great advantage in using chemical weapons under a certain time and space. Now, that doesn't even account for whether that those variables line up to a target that's useful. That's another question. Uh, and there'll be maybe 10% of the time where, yeah, okay, it's a, it's a one for one, you know, chemical weapons versus conventional weapons, you know, they both achieve the same effect. Now, factor in the fact that chemical weapons typically are more expensive, okay, uh, you know, and then there's the other 85% of the year where there's there's not any advantage. In some part of that 85%, there'll be points at which you use the chemical weapons to absolutely no effect. And then you look at the other chart, the conventional weapons. They tend to work in the rain, in the snow, uh, in the mud. You know, they tend to be cheaper. You know, if you start calculating, you know, gee, how much do we need to achieve this particular tactical effect? If we're going to take this city, what do you, what, what's all the expense that involved in it? You know, all of a sudden, there's no point in the chemical weapons. Okay. Mm. And not only that, everybody has got a supply chain and industry to produce the conventional weapons. Yeah, everybody makes bullets. Sudan makes bullets. Okay. You know, right? you know, the world is awash in, in conventional munitions, and conventional munitions have extremely long shelf lives. That's the other thing. You know, yeah, chemical weapons often have pretty piss poor shelf life. <laughs> uh, so, you know, all of a sudden, you take this sort of logistical and operational view, and you calculate it in terms of financial spreadsheets, you're like saying, you're going to spend an awful lot of money for stuff that we can't use 85% of the time. So it's just not efficient and it's too expensive. No. In a certain extent, to a certain extent, these sort of calculations were going on at the end of the First World War. And the first real agreement, the Geneva Protocol on Chemical Weapons in the 1920s, was based on basically the countries of the world saying, this is an easy thing for us to give up. You know, we're not giving up uh, the, all the other new inventions that made their debut. Nobody gave up the airplane. Mm. Nobody gave up the machine gun. Nobody gave up the tank. Nobody gave up the submarine because those were viewed to have promise. Uh, you know, the chemical weapons, were, the majority opinion was sort of they have not lived up to what the manufacturers claimed. And there, there was from the 19 teens all the way to the, about the 1970s, you know, always been a, a minority view saying, well, we just need to make the chemical weapons better. <laughs> okay. And then, but, you know, and you had this arms race. I wrote that whole book on the history of nerve agents. You know, there was this, you know, nerve agents were very much an idea to take that old stuff from the 1920s and make it much, much, much better. But that only changed that calculus a little bit on that, that you know, 85% of the year. That was, a, it turns out to be a little bit of a marginal change, you know, uh, <laughs> you know. If it's really muddy out and it's raining hard, there's there's no point in using a you know a, a persistent nerve agent, for example, on the battlefield. Whereas you might have a huge amount of points to using conventional rockets and conventional artillery and stuff like that. You know. Well, moving away from sort of nerve agents, I think we covered that really well. Thank you for that. So the Ukraine has active nuclear power stations, and it also has the infamous decommissioned Chernobyl facility. Yeah. And there's been gunfights around nuclear power stations and Chernobyl, I believe, is occupied by Russia at the moment, or Russian forces at the moment. What are the risks that something terrible could happen, like an accidental shelling of a nuclear power station is active? What would happen? 
again, this is this is a range of variables, and I am I'm not an expert in how these particular you know nuclear power plants are designed. I'm I'm under the rough understanding that the other ones are different design than the old Chernobyl one because you know they, it did cause a bit of a redesign. Uh, I also under the opinion uh, that you know and I've I've heard, I've heard this from several other people that the Ukrainians in charge of these nuclear power plants you know have done well to shut them down as opposed to you know operating them at 100% capacity. The, the Chernobyl accident happened because they were exceeding the capacity of the place and they, and they were really pushing the limits of it. You know, if you, I mean, it's, it's a crass simplification, but you know, a nuclear power plant is like a big engine and lots of things going on. And if you shut the thing down, there's a lot less scope for things to go on. Okay. It's another thing that has gone almost unnoticed uh, in recent days is both Ukraine and Moldova have effectively wired themselves into the main in the main European electricity grid. So therefore, Ukraine can shut these power plants down and still have some 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 power going to places unless those places get physically cut off. Uh, so I'd say existing nuclear power plants, you know, as long as they get shut down to a safe condition, there's not a huge amount of scope. Mm. Uh, now, Chernobyl itself is a little bit of a, it's a big waste site, effectively. Mm. Uh, I, I'd also say, the scope for really serious problems is fairly limited because you'd have to do a huge amount of engineering to do it. I'm not going to say suicidal engineering, but you'd have to have a lot of guys, you know, wiring the place up with explosives and all that. And, all the, and you'd, you'd see it days ahead of time because it would take a lot of work because there's like big concrete sarcophagus and stuff like that, you know. And it wouldn't be worth it. No, no, no. And, it, and this sort of touches on another thing. I'm going to relate this to the chemical warfare stuff. There's a point at which, at what point do Russian military personnel just rebel and say, no, fuck it, we're not going to do this. Uh, you know, this Chernobyl, you got me on top of this concrete sarcophagus with a bunch of explosives. This ain't right. You know, we've got Russian soldiers already surrendering. Uh, what does it take for an actual mutiny? Mm. Um, because that relates back to the chemical warfare thing. One of the one of the disadvantages of chemical warfare is historically it's almost inevitable that you end up having friendly casualties from it. Okay, and so if Russian units start getting this idea, oh my God, we're using the gas, but the gas is causing our own guys to die too. Um, you know, we're back to a 1917 scenario because we forget that one of the reasons why uh, the Russian revolutions there were two Russian revolutions in 1917. The Russian army, the Tsarist army, basically down tools. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you know, we 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 have this fallacy in the West, uh, sort of, because we were on the winning side of the First World War that our allies also won. No, Russia lost the First World War. Mm. Russia surrendered. Okay. <laughs> the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 19, early 1918. Russia surrendered. Uh, you know, they lost the First World War. Okay. Uh, and they lost it largely because their army folded. You know, I, I'm just saying it has a lot to do with chemical warfare, but it has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, the army ran out of food, was running out of ammunition, you know, incurring lots of casualties against a better armed foe. And entire units of the Russian military were rebelling or just simply just downing tools saying, no, we're not, you know, we're just not doing anything. Uh, so, you know, we, we forget the lessons of the First World War. Also, because we were on the victorious side by us, I say, U.S., U.K., France, you know, um, we forget the problems that the French had with mutinies in the war because we like to think we, we won through superior might in that war. Well, we won more or less because we had enough might still left when the, when the Germans started downing tools in, in, in late 1918. You know, you know the, the, the German army went on strike, you know, particularly the German Navy downed tools and mutinied, you know, so, so yeah. You start getting into sort of the chemical and radiological scenarios, and that, that very easily could backfire on, on the Russians. Yeah, in those situations, we were, we were talking about this on Twitter the other day. You end up having to wear these ridiculous suits that are very uncomfortable, yeah. get very hot, and I don't think any soldier is going to want to be stuck in that every day, all day. Yeah, and so it becomes. I mean, the the interesting thing about chemical weapons and chemical warfare is that it's a category of weapon that, unlike bullets and bombs, there is a quick and easy countermeasure. You can have suits and gas masks and gloves. And if, you're, if your troops are good at using them, 98% of those, those casualties go away. Uh, but often you substitute it for other things. So it become, and so instead of chemical weapons becoming a weapon, they become an operating environment. And they become a, a nasty operating environment, but not one dissimilar to cold weather or really hot weather or uh, working in a jungle with lots of infectious diseases and mosquitoes and stuff like that. And it becomes an operating environment. 
But the countermeasures to make you uh, to allow you to work in that operating environment incur a penalty. Guys crash tanks because they're not used to driving a tank in a gas mask. You know, uh, the minute it starts getting warmer, so you start incurring heat casualties and stuff like that. And I'd also say the Russian army is still kind of stuck in a Cold War era chemical protective equipment. I, you know, I've been looking at this stuff. You know, their, their suits and masks are have not undergone the improvement that that their counterparts in places like the UK, Germany, America have gone, uh, gone through. You know, a, a modern a modern chemical warfare suit in the US Army is not terribly different than the, the normal camouflage uniform you wear. It's no longer like heavy charcoal or butyl rubber. It's fancy Gore-Tex. And today's M50 Joint Service protective mask weighs a lot less than the old one weighed, and you can drink from a canteen in it and do all sorts of other stuff. So, you know, there's been this wave of improvement, but, you know, you don't see that improvement in their kit, all right? I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you that, frankly, they've never, you know, since the end of the Cold War, I don't think the Russians ever really seriously took the, the threat of somebody using chemical warfare against them, okay? Yeah, because they probably thought it would um, never get that far. Well, yeah, 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 exactly. Whereas, you know, I mean, several dust-ups with Saddam Hussein and, you know, conflicts in the Middle East and all that, and, you know, uh, you know, the, U- uh, the U.S., the U.K., France, you know, all the major Western powers, you know, have, have sunk money into, into defensive development. So there's protective clothing and equipment and chemical defense is much better than it used to be. It's not perfect. But also what it means is that those penalties for operating in the operational environment are much less than they, are, than they were. So the gear isn't as hot to wear. And it's easier to drink from a canteen. So you're going to have proportionally less heat casualties in, a, in an operational environment than you might have 30 years ago. It's not as uncomfortable. It's still uncomfortable, but it's not great. But it's it's going to incur less of a penalty then than it would now. Mm. I, I just don't see the, the, the Russian stuff having improved at that point. So we're down to what's the point here? Uh, down to the point is, is there a, is there a provocation? Okay, uh, a false flag. Is Putin going to put a bunch of chemicals in some village somewhere and, you know, make an atrocity and blame it on somebody else? Uh, is that possible? Certainly. Okay. To what end, I would say? It's not like he's at the point where anybody in the West is going to believe him, except the the, the, the cranks and loons that already believe him anyway. Uh, and it's not it's not like that that nucleus is growing. The the, the sort of frankly the tankies and the and the and the far right weirdos and the, the people who are inclined to believe Putin, uh, their ranks aren't growing. In fact, they're probably losing a little bit here and there through attrition. Well, yeah, I'm thinking. Do any positive of all this is it shining a light on those cranks? And yeah, it makes it ever so obvious who they are. You know, and mm. you know. It's been obvious to some of us for a very long time, and now I'm like I'm I, 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 I fear to say I'm actually been right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't like being right on some of these things, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. But an atrocity and blamed on the Ukrainians isn't going to win any converts. Okay, uh, so it would only maybe for domestic political consumption, where he's trying to control the uh, the information space within Russia. I mean, that's the only gain I could think of is that he needs dirty tricks like that to keep the domestic population on side as all of a sudden people's kids start going missing, you know, because they died at the front and nobody said anything or, or getting captured. I mean, it's terribly clever. The Ukrainians, the first thing they do is a cup of tea, here's a mobile phone, call your ma. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. But sanctions are gradually going to, they already had a bit of a bite. You know, sanctions are a long, slow burn. You know, I, I, I fear that Putin needs to resort to dirty tricks, whether this is uh, to, to maintain a domestic momentum. Mm hmm. Uh, whether this will be it or not, I don't know. I mean, this is mind you, this is a guy who allegedly blew up Russian apartment blocks, yeah, you know, and killed killed innocent people, uh, and did it uh, to provoke war with Chechnya. Uh, so anything is possible. Mm, oh, definitely. This might be a nice segue into a topic that I wanted to just briefly ask you about about the risk of the use of nuclear weapons. Both there's talk of Russia has tactical nukes which they think they could use in a limited way. There's a risk, obviously, of a full-blown World War III nuclear confrontation, and there are people online saying, well, it's survivable. Is it? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on all this? People have, a, like with chemical warfare, people have a, a fairly f- fixed and limited frame of reference on, chemi- uh, on nuclear weapons. Uh, and I'm not saying nuclear weapons are a good thing, or I'm not even saying they're a bad thing either, because honestly, I think that they served a purpose in deterrence and, you know, uh, for 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 um, seventy odd years, yeah, 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 and I, I think that's still kind of helping out here too. I mean, to be honest, though, maybe the nuclear deterrence is keeping us out of a actual you know, sort of ground World War Three with the 
you know, uh, you know, if, if nuclear weapons had gone away 20 years ago, just totally gone away, nobody had them, probably for damn sure Polish and Romanian and British and, you know, American soldiers would be fighting against the Russians in Ukraine right now. Okay. And even Russia might be bolder and have gone for Poland and other countries yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Back to the initial issue. Okay. There are not many tactical uh, nuclear weapons left in the West. Okay. Uh, the U.S., Mostly got rid of them, except for one type that is air delivered. The U.S. got out of the whole, you know, torpedoes, surface to air missiles, you know, artillery shells. I mean, the U.S. the U.S. Army got rid of all of its tactical weapons and nuclear weapons in the early '90s. Saved a lot of money doing so because those things were a pain. Okay, the U.S. retained a handful, a couple hundred. Now, I think people have a a scale associated with nuclear weapons, which is Hiroshima. Okay, that's like the one thing we know. Yeah. All right. If you I take a, if you take one of these tactical nuclear weapons and dial it down to the sort of the bottom level of its operating range, you get an explosion that is smaller than the conventional one that happened in Beirut in the in the fertilizer warehouse. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why some cranks were thinking, "Oh my God, it's a nuke." It was technically big enough to have been a small nuke. Okay. And it was a mushroom cloud, so it kind of looked like one to the casual observer. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, I, I I can point to a I can point to a lovely painting from the 1700s of a mushroom cloud because there's a big <laughs> gunpowder explosion in Gibraltar, and it caused. Are you a, a collector of these paintings? Well, oh uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mushroom cl- mushroom clouds happen from conventional explosions. Yes. You know, is it to do with like dust and wind vectors and yeah, you know, force? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, you know, hot air rising in a, you know, a big sort of fireball of hot air rising and gradually cooling off. And as it cools off, it, you know, yeah. And there's a lot of conventional things that can cause that to happen, too. So, you know, anyway, so on a practical level, could you have a nuclear, a small nuclear attack that t- just takes out an air base? Yeah. Okay. Also, you know, much of our fear of, you know, World War Three and all the, you know, and nuclear winter, all that has to do with nuclear fallout. Now, I'm going to explain something to you interestingly. You know, if you have a nuclear weapon, nuclear weapon here, you know, visual aid, uh, I know this is not going to got, come yeah. out on the podcast, but. <laughs> What's that, a lid uh, in a, a glasses case, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Uh, if nuclear weapon goes off at ground level, okay, that's when you get the fallout because the fallout is basically all this shit in the ground, all that dirt and buildings and stuff that get vaporized. Now, if you explode at the ground level, you've not maximized the blast radius of that weapon, okay? Particularly small nuclear weapons. So you actually detonate it in the air, okay? It's still not a good thing. There's still going to be some radiation. There's still going to be stuff made radioactive. But the huge downwind hazards don't happen, mm. okay? And now, I'm, I, I'm not trying to give anybody any ideas on this. Uh, I'm just saying if Putin takes out a you know, Ukrainian air base with a small airburst, um, we're not all of a sudden going to have to go to run to our basements in Western Europe. Okay. Now, that also becomes a fundamentally different change. It might be when, you, you know, Biden's got to get on that red telephone. It's not actually a red telephone. It's a bloody fax machine in the basement of the White House. Send a fax. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it's called the MoLink. And say, listen, listen, Vova, what the hell are you doing? Cut that shit out. You guys, next time it's... You know, I, and I think, you know, we really do need to, we really do need to have a, uh, a red line on that. I don't know what the red line is, but is the red line, okay, that happens, your Navy is sunk. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, how hard can it be to sink the entire Russian Navy? Okay. I mean, something like that. I mean, you have to, you have to draw the line, you know, and we're not just frozen your assets. You're never getting them back, you know. Uh, we're not, we're not just sanctioning, uh, oligarchs, we're interning them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're throwing them in. Yeah. You know, uh, things like that, you know, uh, there, cause there's a lots of escalation that could happen that doesn't involve nuking him back, but you know, yeah, it's, meh. what is the risk of a nuclear confrontation between the West and Russia and how survivable would that be? Well, I, 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 yeah, again, survivable depends on the scale and there's a, there's sort of a, you know, if Russia sh- it takes all its shit and throws it in America and Western Europe, yeah, it's the end of the world, and vice versa. But I think are there scenarios between here and there that you know are survivable, particularly if you're not underneath it. Like I said, if you know it would really ruin your day to be stuck in that airfield when that thing went off, that would cause a lot of panic, a huge amount of panic. But so so I mean, there's a range of outcomes from. It looks really bad, really bad in the local area, but physically speaking, not bad for the rest of the world. 
all the way to it really is doomsday. But there is a curve here. It's been a long time since I thought about that curve, you know. One scenario that played out, well, that came up when Putin originally changed the nuclear alert level, there was somebody somewhere, um, and I don't know how reliable they were, where they said that Putin you know, might consider at least just nuking one European capital to make a point, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, if that happens, I mean, crikey. Because the problem is, is the interpretation of firing one nuke, isn't it? Because it's, yeah. surely if one ICBM goes in the air, that sets off alerts that people don't know what that person's doing with that ICBM. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, new, uh, using a tactical nuclear weapon doesn't trigger those things because, you know, it's it's a large artillery shell or it's a rocket or it's, a, it's an airplane. It doesn't look any different. You know, we've got this, the U.S. and presumably people like the French and the Chinese and, and the British do as well, have got satellites whose only job it is to look at these Russian you know, missile silos. And, and they, they, they look for things like the flash of the rockets and all that, you know, the rocket engines. So there's a, there, there's a lot of intelligence infrastructure looking at like missile sites and looking for things like ballistic missile submarines coming up to sort of firing depth and stuff like that. And that's a fundamentally different point than some single bomb being put on an airplane and flown to, to, to Ukraine. That's, you know, there, there's less observables on that. But, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come out and make a controversial statement. Go for it. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons why we're even having this discussion now is the Russian military isn't what it was cracked up to be. How rotten is it? Mm. Okay. All right, if basic shit like rations for, for soldiers in the field, uh, tires, you know, uh, not, not having thought through refueling of the damn tanks, okay? So, you know, you know, you know Time Magazine's man of the year might be the John Deere tractor, okay? Um, <laughs> if that happens, I'm going to sue. <laughs> they better give me credit for that. <laughs> um, how much how much of this rot extends to the, to the nuclear weapons infrastructure? Because the nuclear weapons, uh, 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 going back to what I said about chemical weapons being expensive and fiddly, uh, nuclear weapons are very expensive and very fiddly. You know, an, an ICBM with its either solid or liquid rocket motors and it got a lot of guidance and a lot of. I mean, it doesn't take many mice to nibble some cables. Okay. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of dry rot to happen around a gasket, and when you try to launch that 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 rocket, the whole damn thing blows up. Honestly, honestly, the whole yeah, you, know, you you launch the thing, and the nuke lands, and the nuke is a dud. Okay, because there's lots of parts. You know, a nuclear weapon is actually very complicated. Got lots of parts, and there's a lot of there's a lot of maintenance involved. How much of that is just not being done because people who are crooked, lazy, or under resourced? It's a very good question. I do. My only slight concern is Putin put a lot of efforts post Kursk into nuclear subs. Yeah. So whether the submarines are pretty good and yeah. everything else is a bit shite <laughs> because they put all their efforts there, I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, a nuclear sub has got two nuclear components. There's the, there's the warheads. Yeah. You know, and missiles and the actual gener uh, the generation of power for the sub, you know. Historically, we've had Kursk, and the U.S. had two nuclear uh, reactor accidents and subs, the Thresher and the Scorpion. They both went, uh, what's the phrase that they used? Uh, going going Dutchman. It's going Dutchman, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, which I guess is a reference to the old days when a, a Dutch East Indies ship would just leave the Netherlands and just never come back, and ooh, a going Dutchman. Evidently, it happened. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the Thresher and the Scorpion went Dutchman, and they had nuclear reactor problems. I mean, so so that's, you know, it's nuclear, but I'm not sure that's necessarily the same category thing I said, you know. Making making the ships safe to sail is not necessarily whether or not the missile's going to work or the warhead. So it's neither a good nor a bad thing because you can still end up with World War III. But if ten dud missiles get fired, we're probably still going to have to torch the, torch the Russians for it, <laughs> and then find out that they were duds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, I mean, this is this is bad calculus, but it's bad calculus that vaguely favors the West. Yeah, yeah. So so and these are imponderables. So I don't, yeah. At the end of the day, I don't know. I'm just some guy speculating, but I do know that you know there's an it takes an awful lot to keep a nuclear deterrent going. And you have to question if, you know, if they can't keep the guy fighting at the front uh, full of bullets and fuel for his vehicle, whether some nuclear silo out in the middle of Siberia that is very, very difficult to get to, whether all those guys out there, when nobody watching them, have actually been doing the maintenance. Yeah, that's a good question. We'll probably better wrap up in a minute. But is there anything else you'd like to add on Ukraine before we do wrap up? 
Ukraine's a, yeah, it, people ask me how this is going to end. I don't know how it's going to end. I'd say probably, yeah, if you were to sort of lay out the the possibilities, I, I think even then, uh, you know, I, I take a piece of paper, put five, six, seven, eight possibilities. I don't have a majority verdict on those. Of those things I would put on a piece of paper, the most likely scenario of them, and I'm not saying, you know, a, a, a sort of a 20 or 30% scenario, but is probably both sides basically running out of steam in a de facto ceasefire. Mm. Okay. And I, I can see that very much happening. Yeah. And do you think there'd be like a division of Ukraine, like East and West Ukraine, like Germany? Well, yeah, we, could, we, we could end up with a de facto Cyprus situation, uh, a de facto, you know, North and South Korea situation. We could, we could. Uh, that would not necessarily be politically palatable to the Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, I'm by saying it, we may end up with that almost by stealth or default, because if fighting just slows to a halt one day because both sides are exhausted, then you need, some, you need to overcome some inertia to start it again, okay? Mm. Uh, and, and, you, and you end up with, you know, a frozen conflict. So is that the most ideal situation? I don't think it is, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I can't. I certainly. Can't, I think. I think of all the things that could happen. That uh, I don't think the Russians are going to somehow sort of pull their thumbs out and all of a sudden, you know, win, because this has gone on long enough now that you know, there's an angry Ukrainian behind every gra- blade of grass. Okay, you know, and the further west you get in Ukraine, the more the terrain suits partisan resistance, and it's a partisan resistance that is going to be actively pushed by the West and not, you know, in a in a, in a way that wasn't done previously. So. And places like Kharkiv and Kiev are, uh, have had weeks now to fortify themselves and turn themselves into, uh, you know, hedgehogs or porcupines. So uh, the Ukrainians are clearly going to make every, uh, you know, fight for every square inch here, and they're going to, and they're going to make it, you know, make it hurt, you know. And so I just don't know how it's going to go. There you go. There you have it. Well, there we are. Well, thank you. Well, look, where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Uh, largely on my Twitter feed. I'm at Dan Kazita on Twitter. That's largely where I'm at. You know, I'm very good on my Twitter feed about signposting to the things that I have written and you know published and stuff like that. Is Buckingham Palace open today? <laughs> it probably. I know you get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, I know three people who work there. Yeah. <laughs> I live a thousand yards yeah. away. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. boarded up. You know, we we would notice. <laughs> <laughs> Just for some context, people aren't aware of that. Uh, there's an accusation by conspiracy theorists that Buckingham Palace is in a no-go zone and all boarded up and yeah, what have you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So occasionally I do a proof-of-life photograph, of, you know, with me with that day's you know, newspaper standing in front of Buckingham <laughs> Palace, you know. No, even that's not good enough for their fruits and nuts, you know. Yeah, yeah, obviously photoshopped, you know. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. No, no, Chris, it's, it's been lovely as usual. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.